Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another episode of Things Kerbal Space Program Doesn't Teach You. I regularly talk about hypergolic propellants. They are a core concept in rocket science. Propellant combinations that when they are mixed, they spontaneously combust, meaning that rocket scientists can get away without ignition systems that might fail. This is, of course, at the expense of the lucky people who get to handle the propellant loading for the rocket. So I wanted to talk about hypergolic fuels in a bit more detail. The most common form of hypergolic oxidizer is dinitrogen tetroxide. Of course, most people that actually use this stuff choose to save a syllable and they say nitrogen tetroxide instead, even though that's not technically correct. The molecule consists of two nitro groups, that is a nitrogen atom and a pair of oxygen atoms, and these two are, groups are joined by a single weak bond between the nitros, the nitrogens. Uh, and in fact, uh, in liquid, that bond can actually be rather weak and it will break and reform. Uh, the nitrogen dioxide is brown while the nitrogen tetroxide is clear. So near its freezing point, the liquid is basically clear, but as it warms up, more and more of it disassociates or breaks down, and you get a browner and browner liquid. And of course, when the stuff spills and you get a big orange cloud, that orange is coming from nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen tetroxide generally isn't used as a 100% pure propellant. It's usually mixed with other stuff. Uh, in the Apollo spacecraft, for example, they added 1% nitric oxide primarily to make it less corrosive. Uh, this was referred to as green nitrogen tetroxide, but in modern spacecraft, it's referred to as mixed oxides of nitrogen. That's nitric oxide, nitric dioxide, and dinitrogen tetroxide. Usually this is abbreviated to MON and with a number to indicate the percentage of nitric oxide that's been added. For example, the Space Shuttle's orbital maneuvering system used MON3. And if there's, say, a need to lower the freezing point from minus 11 Celsius to something more useful for space travel, MON25 will give you liquids down to about minus 55 centigrade. That's your oxidizer. Over on the fuel side, you have the hydrazine family of chemicals. Your basic hydrazine consists of a pair of nitrogen atoms with four hydrogen atoms hanging around the outside. Technically, it could be called tetrahydridodinitrogen, but nobody would ever do that because it's hard to say. But that's the least of your problems because it's not stable either. With just a little bit of prompting, it'll happily split apart into hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia and release a fair amount of energy in the process. For this reason, hydrazine is actually used as a monopropellant by passing it over a heated catalyst bed to drive the decomposition so the gases can exhaust out a nozzle and give you attitude control on your space probe. But hydrazine's first use as a rocket fuel was in the Messerschmitt ME-163B Comet, the rocket-propelled fighter seen in World War II. The, the, sub, the fuel for this was Seestoff, which was 30% hydrazine, 57% methanol, and 13% water, while the Tstoff oxidizer was about 80 to 85% hydrogen peroxide cut with uh, water. So pure hydrazine generally isn't used in bipropellant combination because its tendency to decompose means that it can't be used for regenerative cooling and also it just under the right conditions can spontaneously explode. Also its freezing point is about 2 degrees Celsius which is inconveniently high for many applications. So instead we have monomethyl hydrazine. This replaces one of the hydrogen atoms with a methyl group, that is a carbon and three hydrogen atoms. This lowers the freezing point down to minus 52 Celsius and makes it far more stable. These benefits do come at a cost. You get a little less performance compared to pure hydrazine. Also, the density is a little lower, so you need larger tanks. Monomethyl hydrazine and mixed oxides of nitrogen are used in bipropellant reaction control thrusters on the uh, Dragon, in their Draco thrusters, at the Space Shuttle, the Cygnus, and many, many other spacecraft. But MMH is still not stable enough for those big regeneratively cooled rocket engines. So to make that work, you need to replace another one of those hydrogen atoms with another methyl group to get dimethyl hydrazine. Except you very specifically want the unsymmetrical version, or UDMH. 
Unsymmetrical means that you have one nitrogen atom that has both methyl groups while the other nitrogen atom has just the two hydrogens. The symmetric version uh, splits the methyl groups either way, but it's not desirable in rockets because the symmetrical version has a melting point of about minus nine centigrade, whereas the unsymmetrical version has a melting point of minus 57 and therefore is way better if you're working in cold areas. UDMH is stable enough to be stored for years without any chance of decomposing. And it was also stable when you're trying to cool the raging inferno inside your rocket's combustion chamber. In exchange, you do give up a little more specific impulse and its density is also a little lower than even MMH. So UDMH and NTO are both together used as propellant combinations in the Russian Proton rocket, India's PSLV and China's Long March 2, 3 and 4 and a number of other rockets out there. However, there is a fourth option that has also been used in the past. It's known by its trade name of Aerozine 50 and it's made by mixing 50% hydrazine with 50% UDMH. This actually gets a better specific impulse and density than UDMH. It gives you a lower melting point than pure hydrazine and is stable enough to be used on large engines. Aerozine was the fuel used by the Titan rockets and it was also used by the upper stage of the Delta II and the main engines on the Apollo command module and the descent engines on the lunar module. Aerozine of 50 was of course a made up name. It was designed and developed by Aerojet. And it turns out that mixing these two things together isn't as simple as you imagine. If you just take the two chemicals and put them in a big bath and stir them, they will actually tend to stratify because the difference in the density is about 20%. So Aerojet had to develop a mixing system or a blending system. And it was very similar to the way fuel injectors in rockets work. They would have vents or uh, nozzles that would spray into each other and create a cascade of very small droplets which would then ensure very thorough mixing and therefore a stable mixture. However, as of right now, I think they've stopped making it and the last time it was used was on the second stage of the very last Delta II which launched ISAT-2 back in 2018. So those are the main hypergolic propellants in use today. But in the past, we've seen a few other notable compounds. In particular, before nitrogen tetroxide was all the rage, nitric acid was where it was at. It was the oxidizer of choice. The stuff that you might have to deal with in chemistry class is heavily diluted with water, but when you use nitric acid in rocket propellants, it will be 100% with just the acid. And at these high concentrations, the acid will actually decompose into nitrogen dioxide and water. And that makes, if you have the pure stuff, it's called white fuming nitric acid. And the fumes coming off are nitrogen dioxide. It'll pick up a little bit of a yellow cast from dissolved nitrogen dioxide. And early on in the development, the engineers realized that you could take white fuming nitric acid and add 13% dinitrogen tetroxide and get red fuming nitric acid which had better performance overall and then the, real, uh, the engineers realized that actually it was the nitrogen tetroxide that was doing all the work and it was much better overall. The corrosive qualities of the nitric acids would just be a big problem overall. Um, so they would attack the fuel systems, the valves, the tanks and so they had to add inhibitors to them. So this is where you would get inhibited fuming nitric acid. Typically an inhibitor is something like hydrofluoric acid. And while that sounds a little crazy to add an even stronger acid, what happens is that very weak 1% hydrofluoric acid attacks the vulnerable areas and then creates a very thin fluoride layer that protects it from the nitric acid. So this creates a whole insoluble barrier that protects all your components overall. And apparently North Korea have had issues with this. Some of the wreckage that has been recovered had failures that were related to the fact that they weren't using inhibited red fuming nitric acid. Nitric acid has been used as an oxidizer with many fuels. Hydrazine, UDMH, turpentine, 
furfural alcohol, uh, there's something called Tonka. Uh, it's still seen in many old military missiles, but even the likes of North Korea and Iran have stopped using it for their launch vehicles and moved on to nitrogen tetroxide, so it's basically obsolete by now. So anyway, all of these propellants are horribly nasty things to be around. Not only are they designed to burn with great fury, they are corrosive, they are toxic and very likely carcinogenic. Handling them requires teams working with self-contained pressure suits and not only does that take extra time, it takes extra money, making them less desirable as cleaner options have, redu have come in and replaced them. The US stopped flying Titan in 2005 and Russia is kind of in the process of phasing out the, fo the Proton. But, you know, because, you know, RP-1 and liquid oxygen are a lot easier to clean up when they are spilled. So in the long term, I don't see any huge breakthrough in propellant chemistry which will improve upon the hydrazine nitrogen tetroxide combination. Uh, while we have new clean monopropellants, there's not really the same opportunities for clean hypergolic propellants. So we'll be seeing these for a long time to come. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.